Hi, everyone, and welcome to LearnNeuroRadiology.com. I'm Brent Weinberg, the founder of Learn Neuroradiology. Today, I'm excited to bring to you a new topic. We're going to talk about brain imaging. This is going to be part of a series of videos that we did for our medical students here as part of a capstone course. But this is going to give you a broad introduction to a lot of topics you need in brain imaging. We're going to talk about some of the different modalities that are performed in brain imaging. We're going to talk about the times you might select different types of imaging. We're going to give you some basics about how you might go through those images on your own. And then we're going to give you some practice cases that you can go through. And these will be interactive that are available on the website. And we'll have videos to walk you through them. So without further ado, let's dive into brain imaging and let's get started. This first video is going to be just mainly about the modalities that are performed, how you might approach them, and some specifics about those modalities. Be sure to tune in for the rest of the videos, though, once you finish this one. Thanks. So as I said, welcome everyone to the Brain Imaging course. This is going to be part one about imaging modalities. Uh, this is going to be part of a broader series of lectures where we're going to introduce you to some basic concepts of brain imaging. We'll go through some sample normal cases. We'll review some of the common causes of pathology. And then at the end, there'll be some interactive cases that you can go through on your own. And we'll have video explanations of those so you can see uh, the expert uh, way of going through those. The overall objectives for this course is going to be to learn some of the basic concepts of different modalities used in brain imaging and be able to choose the appropriate studies. So if you're a consumer of imaging or use imaging in your practice uh, or at work, uh, hopefully this will help you uh, be able to figure out what kind of study you might want to do. Uh, we'll see some common imaging appearances of several common diseases, uh, such as stroke, hemorrhage, tumor, and infection. And you'll have a chance, to, like I said, to practice on some cases that are interactive that you'll be able to check out on our website. I want to give a special thanks to Nikki Friedman, one of my colleagues at Emory. She helped uh, me put this together, found a bunch of the cases, and uh, helped me put together the med student capstone that this is based upon. Uh, so just thank you very much to Dr. Friedman. So the modalities that you run into in brain imaging, uh, they're sort of varied, but really uh, the main workhorses of imaging and brain imaging are CT or computer tomography and a magnetic resonance imaging or MRI. Now you can do the conventional sort of structural imaging, but a lot of times we'll also do vessel imaging uh, or angiography. And if it's uh, timed to look at arteries, we call that angiography. If it's timed to look at veins, uh, we call that venography. And you can do the same things with MR. Uh, a lot of times we'll do MRA or MR venogram, and uh, you can do it of the head or of, of the neck. And so these are ways to see the vessels of the head and neck and the blood supply to the brain. Now, CT of the head uh, is most commonly done without contrast. This is really a screening exam. So when a patient shows up to the hospital, we want to evaluate them for serious pathology of the brain. Uh, we do a CT of the head. You can see some of the common findings of stroke, hemorrhage. If someone's been in trauma, you may be able to see that they have a fracture. You can see edema of the brain, or you can see if they have hydrocephalus. And so these are common uses of CT. It is also used as a follow-up examination to examine the evolution of these kinds of findings, right? So if you know someone has hydrocephalus, you can follow it up over time. Uh, now the CT of the head with contrast, it's theoretically possible. Uh, you would give contrast during that to detect enhancement of things such as infection or tumors. But in practice, like it's almost always inferior to MRI. So if you see something, you're gonna have to do an MRI to see additional detail and see the other lesions you didn't see. If you don't see anything, you're probably going to do an MRI anyway uh, to get additional detail uh, about any additional lesions. So uh, you're probably going to have to do an MRI. So if if you can help it, it's better to just skip the contrast CT and go straight to, uh, to MRI. Now, if you don't have MRI available or you can't get it because you have an absolute contraindication to MRI, like a piece of metal in your eye or something where you can't get it, but we can do CTs of the head with contrast as well. And sometimes that that's helpful, but we don't do it very often. Uh, in reality, there's, like I said, there's really no practical use for a CT head with contrast in the current era. And you should just uh, do a non-contrast head CT and then go straight to MRI if uh, the person has indications for it. Now, CT angiogram is a special form of CT that's done with contrast. It's an arterially timed exam to evaluate the arteries of the neck and brain. And uh, this is commonly used to evaluate for vascular diseases. So we most commonly do it in stroke. It's really a keystone of stroke evaluation right now. Uh, if you have an intracranial hemorrhage, 
and you're looking for abnormalities behind it, such as an aneurysm or vascular malformation, you might do a CT angiogram. Uh, we do them sometimes in trauma to uh, evaluate for traumatic vessel injuries, and like I said, to look for aneurysm or, or vascular malformations. So a CT venogram is very similar to a CT angiogram, only the timing is a little bit later. So you do it to see the veins of the brain, and it's usually uh, to evaluate for venous thrombosis or venous trauma. So here you see just a sagittal image of the brain. You see the superior sagittal sinus here. It's filled with contrast. So if you just wait a little bit later after a CT angiogram, you'll get a CT venogram. Now, what is the role of x-rays in uh, neuroradiology? It's kind of limited. We don't do a lot of x-rays. We really just do it to evaluate for uh, shunts as to see if the shunts are in an appropriate position and if they have any discontinuity. Sometimes we'll do x-rays to evaluate hardware or pieces of metal, like I said, to look for MRI. Here you see just an x-ray of a patient with a shunt. You can see the programmable device here and the shunt tubing coming down the side of the neck there. So x-rays can be useful in that setting, but then we really don't use them very much in neuroradiology. As I said, uh, there's really no routine role for x-ray in brain evaluation. Uh, you can't see the brain and it's, not, it's simply not useful. So MRI of the brain can be performed with or without contrast, and often you'll get images uh, that are done with, uh, with each. So you'll do some images before contrast and some after. Uh, this is really the workhorse of neuroradiology. It's kind of a secondary exam to evaluate and find intracranial disease. We have multiple sequences that tell us different things about the tissue contrast. And you see an array of the different types of sequences that you might see here. We're going to spend a little time talking about those sequences as well. Now, there are some limitations of MRI. Uh, it, if patients have metallic form bodies or devices, they often may not be able to get an MRI, which can be a difficulty. It also takes longer and it's more expensive, so it's a harder resource to obtain. Uh, so you may not have access to it in every, uh, in every setting. Now, as I said, MRI has a variety of sequences that we perform. Each one tells us a little bit of something different about the brain. Uh, we do uh, T1-weighted imaging and T2-weighted imaging. Now, these are relaxation times, so they're part of the physical properties of, uh, of tissue. A flare is an inversion recovery, so it's like a T2 that has uh, the water removed. We'll talk more about that in a little bit. We can do diffusion imaging to uh, measure how well water moves and that gives us unique features about the tissue. We can also do some blood sensitive imaging, and uh, sometimes you'll see that as a gradient echo imaging, or you may see a more advanced, more modern technique such as uh, susceptibility weighted imaging. And uh, finally, we'll often do T1 weighted imaging after the administration of contrast. So let's dive in a little bit and see what these different sequences are. We'll talk about each one and what each one might be useful for. So the pre-contrast imaging, like you'll often see it in two planes. You might see a sagittal image such as this, which is sort of slicing the brain uh, in half this way. You might see an axial image, which is a cross section of the brain there. And this is a great sequence for overall evaluation of brain structure, the alignment and positioning of the brain. And it also gives you a nice baseline that you'll be able to compare to your post-contrast images that you're going to obtain later. Our T2 sequence is an excellent way of looking at water content. Uh, water tends to be bright, so here you see the CSF is bright in the ventricles. Anywhere that there's edema or brain swelling will be abnormally bright, and uh, you'll be able to see those fluid structures. So abnormalities on T2 are usually bright. Now, a lot of times we'll take that sequence and make it even more useful by removing the CSF. And so you can see these two images, they're essentially the same, only on this flare the water content of the CSF has been removed. Now you might do that because the CSF uh, is distracting from seeing, you ab seeing abnormalities in the, in the adjacent white matter, uh, but also it uh, just reduces the signal, makes it much easier to see abnormalities in the, in the parenchyma. Uh, again, though, you'll see brain edema, swelling, and uh, abnormal fluid accumulation. And so, like I said, things that are bright on T2 or flare are usually abnormal. Flare is one of the best sequences to search for abnormalities. If you don't know a lot about MRI, you can probably jump directly to Flare and uh, you'll be able to see uh, the abnormalities the best there. Uh, Flare is also the best sequence to compare to CT. So if you have a head CT that shows some edema, uh, it will be very similar looking, only the contrast is flipped because of greater water content will be dark on CT and it'll be bright on Flare. Uh, so you can often compare them directly. Now, T2 versus flare, I kind of showed you the difference there We're on the previous slide. They have essentially the same tissue contrast. So you see the white matter is a little bit darker than the gray matter uh, along the surface of the cortex. Uh, but the fluid has been subtracted from flare, making it easier to see abnormalities. But the pathologic features are the same. Now, here's T1 versus flare. Uh, so you can see the contrast in this case is flipped 
the white matter is a little bit brighter on the T1 with darker gray matter over the top. That's because of the fatty contents and myelin contents on your flare image that is reversed. So the gray matter is a little bit brighter and the white matter is darker. And so that's a way that you can tell, even if you don't have the image labeling, you can kind of get used to these to know if you're looking at a T1 or a flare uh, image. Now on diffusion, uh, diffusion is a way of measuring how well water moves through tissue. DWI stands for diffusion weighted imaging. We commonly use it for the evaluation of stroke. And in stroke, water is restricted because the sodium potassium ATPases in the cell membranes fail. Water pours into the cells for that reason. And uh, intracellular water doesn't move as well as extracellular water. So when water doesn't move as well, it's bright on diffusion weighted imaging. Many MRIs are going to have blood or calcium sensitive imaging, uh, depending on where you are and what kind of scanner you have. That might be a gradient echo or an unrefocused T2 uh, weighted image, or you might have a dedicated susceptibility kind of map or susceptibility weighted imaging. This is useful for seeing areas where the local magnetic field is distorted. Now, most commonly that's going to be from calcium or blood products, and they tend to appear dark. Now, this is just a regular gradient image. You see a little bit of uh, calcification in the choroid plexus here. You see a little bit of dark signal around the vessels. Uh, so blood products and calcium will be dark. Finally, one of the last sequences we'll obtain is our post-contrast images. So intravenous contrast with a gadolinium contrast agent will be administered, and then we'll take additional T1 images. Now this identifies areas of blood-brain barrier breakdown. Uh, so anything in the brain that sort of disrupts the normal uh, sort of cell membranes can cause leakage of contrast into those areas and will become bright. So the kinds of pathologies that enhance like tumors, a metastatic disease, infection, and stroke, uh, these will be abnormally bright on your post-contrast imaging. Now, in order to detect abnormal things that are enhancing, you have to be aware that certain normal things enhance as well, like vessels, the uh, sinuses, uh, the dura, and the choroid plexus. So here you see a post-contrast image. There's a couple of little veins here. You see the choroid plexus is enhancing here as well. So these are normal enhancing structures. Uh, the dural venous sinuses also enhance. So just be aware that some normal structures in the brain enhance. Now, many times we'll do an MR angiogram. MR angiograms of the brain usually don't require contrast because we're using a technique called time of flight which gives us signal based on the flow of blood. A lot of times we'll do MR angiograms when we're not in such a hurry as we might be in doing a CT angiogram. So if a patient's had stroke-like symptoms for maybe more than 24 hours, we might do an MRA. If you know they might have an aneurysm or vascular malformation, we can do an MRA because it doesn't have radiation. We can do it at the same time as an MRI. An MRA of the neck, a lot of times, like it depends like on the institution whether people give contrast for this. It's possible to do it with time of flight, just like the MRA of the head. Uh, but many times people will do it with contrast because your vessel visualization at the upper chest, at the origins of the great vessels, is a little bit better. Again, this tends to be used in the non-emergent evaluation of stroke, looking for vessel abnormalities, carotid or vertebral stenosis. It's a nice tool for seeing the vessels of the neck. A venogram, just like a CT venogram, is uh, just set up to see veins. Uh, so you can, again, do that without or with contrast. Uh, we tend to do them with contrast because it has fewer artifacts. But again, it's time to see the veins of the brain. And uh, it's usually, uh, again, used to evaluate for venous thrombosis or, or venous infarct. So in summary, we've seen a variety of the imaging types like you might use for imaging of the brain. CT uses the density of the tissue and x-rays rotating around the patient to see the brain and bones. MRI uh, has a variety of sequences, has much better soft tissue contrast, so you see the brain better. Uh, but you can take either of these and uh, do targeted imaging of the vasculature if you're looking for vascular pathology such as stroke. And that's in uh, techniques called angiography or venography, and that can be done by CT or MRI. So thanks for tuning into this video. Be sure to check out the next video in which we're going to cover how to choose the best imaging modality. So we'll talk about some of the indications for choosing uh, different types of studies and uh, what kind of information you get from them. Uh, be sure to like the video, check out the rest of the videos on the uh, YouTube channel and learnerradiology.com, and be sure to check back in for videos frequently. Thanks for tuning in today.